a bye week, but that doesn't mean a break from talking about OU and OSU football. Not here on the Bedlam Nation conversation presented by Dodge. Hi, I'm Mike Kaler, Deputy Sports Editor of the Oklahoman, and I'm welcome as always today by OU football beat writer Jake Trotter, OSU football beat writer Scott Wright. We'll do something a little bit different today, taking a look at what we've learned so far and how the teams stack up on offense and defense. That's right, after three weeks, we have first semester report cards. Uh, let's start, start with you first, talk about the offense, Jake. New stars have emerged. How do you grade the offense after the first three weeks of the season? Well, they've scored, what, 50 points in each game? So I'd have to say A. I mean, it really is. They run the ball well. The offensive line is blocking. The wide receivers have caught everything. Ryan Broyles is another threat that has emerged. So I don't know what other grade you can give them. Is this what you were expecting going in? I guess the Broyles factor being kind of the X factor. Uh, of the first three weeks. Well, obviously, Tennessee, Chattanooga, you expected them to score a lot of points, but maybe against Washington and Cincinnati, the way they just moved the ball at will pretty much, I think, was a little bit surprising considering on the road last year they didn't play very well on offense. One of the things everybody talked about going into was whether or not Sam Bradford would deal with kind of a sophomore slump. Same thing that Colt McCoy went through after his great freshman season. But it looks like Sam's really picked it up. You know, he's become the pass efficiency guy uh, in college football, you know. Just so great percentages week after week. Is it, Was that a surprise to you to see that he just kind of picked up where he left off? Not necessarily a surprise, although everybody thought it was possible that he might regress simply because he had such a fabulous freshman year. But he's taken a step further, a step ahead. And really, he is a viable Heisman Trophy candidate, I think, at this point. Anytime you have almost as many incompletions as you do touchdown passes, you're going to be uh, you know, in the mix. That's one thing Stoop talked about at his, at his press conference this week. It's kind of Sam being in in the mix with all those things. CBS Sports comes out and Sam's number one on their initial list. Do you see him hanging in the Heisman race the whole way through? As long as OU doesn't fall apart, I would say yeah. I mean, I think, I don't know if he's going to win it, but he'll be invited to New York if they're like 11-1 and one heading into the Big 12 title game or, or, you know, maybe undefeated at that point. And he's putting up similar numbers. He, he'll have a chance to win it, actually, if that's the case, because, you know, he's on pace to throw for, you know, 50 touchdowns and, you know, six interceptions so if he puts up numbers like that he'll have a chance to go similar to what Jason White did I think Jason White had what 40 touchdowns mm-hmm. six picks when he won it so similar numbers you got a chance all right Scott let's talk about the Oklahoma State offense again you had a star emerge at wide receiver in Des Bryant you know he you know didn't need to play that didn't need to do anything last week for them to win after three weeks how do you grade their offense well, this is a, this this offense is right back where it was. This is a, a an A offense as well. Fifty points a game and, and running all up and down the field like crazy. So you know that's that's the sign of a good offense. Whenever your biggest complaint after a fifty-seven thirteen win is that your star receiver didn't catch any passes. So uh, this is a this is a team that's um, that's really running well on, on all facets right now. Talk a little bit about Kendall Hunter and how he's really emerged as their number one back. Already looking really solid through the first three weeks. Yeah, it was it was a little bit of a surprise because all through August and even uh, even after that Washington State game, Coach Gundy was still talking about this is going to be a, a, a two-man backfield, even a three-man backfield at times. Uh, we're we're going to get Kendall and Bo, Bo Johnson, uh, you know, we, we split in the carries 50-50 and then, and then we'll get Keith Tosin in there when we can. But uh, Bo Johnson has kind of dropped back a little bit. Keith Tosin has really kind of stepped into that number two guy role which is good because he's a good change of pace back. But Kendall Hunter is, uh, has really emerged as the feature back in this offense. You're going to see him getting 20 to 25 carries a game unless you have a situation like you did on Saturday. One of the things we've talked about uh, in kind of planning the next few weeks is Zach Robinson's name really doesn't come up when there, there's all this talk of the great quarterbacks in the Big 12. But he's just kind of done what he's had to do in these first three wins, right? Yeah, he really has. You know, they haven't asked him to run the ball much at all. Um, that'll be something that I think you'll see uh, part of his game that emerges as we get into Big 12 play. Uh, whenever they really need him to, right now it's it's uh, not really necessary. So why why risk getting him hurt? Because really, as he goes, the offense goes at this point. So um, you know, he's he's this is a good time for him because he's he's not being asked to run. He's being asked to throw the ball. He's uh, looks a lot more confident, a lot more comfortable on the deep throws, which is helping to spread the offense out and, and, and give them even more running room in the middle. Alrighty, thanks, Scott. We'll be back to talk about the defense. But first, this word from our friends at Dodge. And we're back here on the Bethel Nation conversation presented by Dodge. Scott, we'll start with you this time, talk about the defense. 
Always a question mark for the Cowboys in you know, the modern era, I guess, going into the season. How do you grade them? Three games, three wins, looked really good at times. What do you think? I'm going to go with a B-plus right now. Now, this is uh, definitely subject to change as they get into some tougher competition. But in, two, in three games this year, they've held two opponents below 200 total yards, which is something they had done once uh, in, in about the past uh, two and a half seasons. So uh, that's really a, a pretty monumental mark for them. Um, there are some, uh, some things that are missing right now that could, uh, could turn out to hurt them as they get into to Big 12 play, one being a pass rush. You know, if you start having to blitz guys uh, against a team that really spreads the field, you're uh, you're opening yourself up to to some of those quick throws that uh, that turn into big yardage when you're, uh, you know, going after Chase Daniel and he's dumping it up to Jeremy Macklin. So, uh, pass rush is going to be a key for them, especially from uh, from the front four, and uh, and then they're going to have to create some more turnovers if uh, if they're going to make the necessary stops to to get their uh, get their offense back on the field. How has the JUCO infusion? Them out on that side of the ball. It's really been a, a pretty good benefit. Um, one guy that they're really going to miss is Lucian Antoine, one of those junior college transfers who tore his ACL in the second game. Uh, he, he's a guy that was really going to be able to contribute back there. And uh, now because of his injury, there are two true freshmen coming onto the field as reserves mm -hmm. in the safety spots. So um, that makes things a little bit difficult. But the other guys, um, we're seeing Donald Booker play more at linebacker. Swanson Miller has been really good at the defensive tackle spot. Um, Maurice Gray and, and some of those other guys are, are getting in there as well. So it's, uh, it's really helped to add some immediate depth, even though those guys aren't being asked to start right now. Um, they're, they're still contributing and, and helping out. Jake, the Sooners go through three wins, looked really good last week against Washington. You know, on defense, really aggressively blitzing Jake Locker. How do you grade the defense? Uh, I give the defense probably an A, too. Uh, what I've been real impressed with them is their overall team speed, especially at the linebacker spots. It's allowed them to blitz uh, unrelentlessly, or uh, I guess relentlessly, against uh, the opposing quarterbacks. Um, we saw that against Washington. I mean, they, came, they brought five, six, seven guys every play. And uh, that put Locker on his heels, and he couldn't really make plays downfield that he's known for making. Cornerbacks have been very good. Dominique Franks and Brian Jackson haven't gotten burnt deep, uh, which has been a problem for the secondary over the years. And uh, the defensive line has controlled the line of scrimmage. I mean, that, I'm thinking that defensive line, if there's a better one in the country, I'd like to see it. I mean, with Gerald McCoy in English and J Jeremy Beal on the other end, um, they're, very di they're very difficult to block. And once they get DeMarcus Granger back and healthy, they're going to be that much better. Talk a little bit the linebackers. That was kind of the, the hole in the middle there that I was wondering about. Ryan Reynolds graded out 95% uh, in the Washington game, which is like unheard of for a linebacker. He looks really good. Um, he looks more athletic, and I think he's benefited from an offseason in which he wasn't rehabbing his knees instead of he's working on his conditioning and his speed, and it showed on the field. And then you got two natural athletes at outside linebacker and Keenan Clayton and Travis Lewis. Mm -hmm. uh, what that allows them to do is you can come up four wide and they can play you a base, or you can go in the eye formation and they can play you a base too, because those guys are so versatile. And um, it, the defense is really gelling. I think the back seven have been very impressive, and that was the big question mark heading into the season. Is Lewis almost the uh, the version of Ryan Broyles on the defensive side, where you didn't really know what you were going to get with him, but you know he's played solid all three games. Well, I think he's even been more of a surprise because we knew mm -hmm. Broyles was going to be a good player. We didn't know how good. Mm -hmm. Travis Lewis was number three on the depth chart a week before the season started behind. Balligan and Austin Box whenever he came back and then for whatever reason Lewis made a move that week leading up to the Chattanooga game has played terrific ever ever since. I mean he's been one of the leading tacklers every game and he's really coming into his own. Boston Box is going to have a hard time getting back on the field with Travis Lewis there. Alrighty that does it for the defense. Our next segment we'll look at the toughest games remaining for the Sooners and Cowboys but first this message from Dodge. Welcome back to the Bedlam Nation Conversation presented by Dodge. I'm Mike Kaler. Our third segment today, we're going to take a look at the remaining season for OU and OSU. What is the most difficult game left on the schedule? Jake, let's go ahead and start with you. OU uh, obviously has Texas coming up, might have the Big 12 Championship. What's, what's the hardest game? Well, this guy to my right would want me to say Oklahoma State, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to. He's saving that for his day. I'm going to say Texas. Texas is not, people aren't talking about him. This is a very good ball club. Uh, offensive line. They're saying it's the best that Mac Brown has had since he's been there, which is saying quite a bit. I believe it's the best team they've had since Vince Young won the national title in 2005, and that's saying something too because they were good in 06. 
Um, Colt McCoy is playing really well. He's bounced back from that sophomore slump. And uh, they have a couple of underrated receivers in uh, Quan Cosby and uh, uh, Jordan Shipley. So they, they have a chance to uh, do some damage in the Big 12, and that's going to be OU's toughest game. Now, going to Stillwater isn't going to be easy either, but the other big game, if it reaches that far, and we're getting ahead of ourselves, beating Missouri and Kansas City is going to be really difficult because Missouri is a legit top five team, and they're going to have a lot of uh, Missouri fans in the stadium at, that, at Arrowhead. Yeah, I mean, you laid it out in Monday's paper. It's not that OU does, OU's going to be a favorite in every, every game, but it, they're not going to be a cakewalk all through the season because Texas Tech is going to be ranked. Uh, you know, they, the Big 12 is, is going to be strong this year, not just Texas. But when, you, when you when you looked at the schedule uh, before the season, I think everybody they play the rest of the year is better than we thought with the exception of Texas A&M, who's mm-hmm. terrible. But everyone else is better. OSU's better. Texas, I think, is better. Um, TCU is better. Baylor is two and one. I don't know when the last time they were two and one. <laughs> so there's teams that have a, a chance to, to uh, give OU a run for the money, especially you know when OU has to go on the road. Which again, I know they beat Washington, but let's face it, Washington, other than Washington State, is the worst team in the Pac-10. All right, Scott. Uh, looking ahead for OSU, they it might not be too long before they have their toughest game. Not counting the Sooners, of course. <laughs> what do you what do you say looking at their schedule? Well. Honestly, the Missouri game is going to be tougher than, than Oklahoma because they're at home for Oklahoma. Uh, for the same problems that Oklahoma is going to face going into Kansas City against the Tigers, Oklahoma State is going into Furrow Field in Columbia. And uh, the, the one thing they have going for them is that Missouri is, uh, has, has Texas the week before and Nebraska the week after. They haven't won in, uh, in Lincoln in a long time, I think around 30 years. Um, so Oklahoma State has a chance to be that trap game, uh, kind of uh, maybe catch them uh, looking ahead. Uh, and that's the one thing that, that the Cowboys have going for them. But their uh, their defense is really going to have to step up uh, by October 11th, and 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 that's the uh, probably the most interesting thing about this is that you have the two biggest games uh, for these the two teams in the state going on the same weekend. Yeah, and that and that's that's the one thing that that you can't get too feeling too safe after the first three weeks because it's. Nothing but harder from here on out for OSU, not just Missouri, but also Texas, also OU. So they've got a they've got a tough road to hoe. Yeah, it's it's really pretty brutal. That brutal. They get Troy and Texas A and M both at home. Good chance of being five and zero going into that Missouri game. Uh, but then in in the weeks after that, they've got they're at Texas, they're at Texas Tech, and they've got the Sooners coming to to Stillwater. So it does not get any easier at all. At Colorado's gonna be tough as well. That's, That's a good right. ball club. Yeah, just ask OU. They had some problems with going to Colorado last time around. Don't you think OSU matches up well with Missouri, though, in terms of if you're looking at a team? Because Missouri is not a great defensive team. They're not, but Oklahoma State's going to have to be able to come up with some stops to get to get their offense back on the field and try to control the ball. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a shootout because obviously Missouri showed that last week when they can score 60, however many points they did against Nevada. So, you know, it's going to have to... It's going to all come down to the OSU defense like it seems like it comes down to year after year. Can they stop somebody, Missouri or Texas Tech, right? Yeah, that's, that's really what it, it's going to come down to. Texas Tech's offense doesn't seem to be quite, uh, quite the uh, powerhouse that it's been, but we'll see if they, uh, if they get things going by the time uh, Oklahoma State heads out to Lubbock. All righty, we'll be back with our final segment, uh, revised predictions for the season. But first, this word from Dodge. We're back on the Bedlam Nation Conversation. I'm Mike Kaler, joined by Scott Wright and Jake Trotter. Guys, in the preseason on this show, we had you predict the year for OU and OSU. Now is your chance to revise. What do you think your teams are ultimately going to end up record-wise? And how about a bowl destination, too, while we're at it? Scott, we'll go ahead and start with you. I, you know, I originally said 8-4. and four. I'm sticking with that. Jake, you mentioned that Colorado is uh, that's going to be a tough game in Boulder, but I still think they can go up there and win that game. One reason is that, that they're going to force Colorado to throw the ball. Um, I think that they'll be able to contain Daryl Scott pretty well in, in the run game. So um, I think I think that they still go in there and win that game and get out uh, at 8-4, and four, and then uh, I'll put them in, uh, we'll say, the Sun Bowl. All right, Jake. Uh, all the marbles on you. How about the Sooners? Can we roll the tape? I don't know what I predicted. At the of the- I think I predicted. <laughs> I think you won. <laughs> I think I predicted OU uh, winning the Big 12, going 11 and one or undefeated, and being the odd team out of the national title. I guess if I would revise that, I'd say that they're the odd team in, or whatever you say, whatever the saying is. Right. And the SEC team is going to be uh, out of the mix because I really think that the SEC is going to beat itself up to the point where you're not going to have an undefeated team. You might not even have a one-loss team. 
I think at worst, OU is going to be one loss. And I frankly, the winner of the Big 12 title has got a very good chance to play at USC for the national championship this year. Just the way the national landscape is shaped, uh, shaping up. Uh, the Big East, the ACC, and the Big Ten are frankly out of it, with the exception of maybe Wisconsin. Um, but Wisconsin does not exactly the you know sexiest team in college football or anything. So I think that the Big 12 has got a great chance, whether that's Missouri, whether that's OU, uh, to play USC. All righty, national title talk already, and it's only September. That does it for this edition of the Bedlam Nation Conversation, presented by Dodds. Be sure to continue the conversation at BedlamNation.com and keep up with all the news from OU and OSU at NewsOK.com, NewsOK.TV, and every day in the Oklahoma.